nanohub.org. You can follow along with this presentation using printed slides from the NanoHub. Visit www.nanohub.org and download the PDF file containing the slides for this presentation. Print them out and turn each page when you hear the following sound. Enjoy the show. Some insider information from an experimentalist. Um, I, I, I thought I was advertised like that, so I tried to do my very best to, uh, to point out what an experimentalist can potentially do in order to shine some light on uh, interesting questions regarding graphene. And uh, my talk will actually be then I can't use the. Uh, oh, you <laughs> oh, you is that okay? <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. So, so let's focus on this side, okay? Because maybe from time to time I have to use the blackboard and then I don't have to go up and down all the time. So, what I'm trying to do is from the very beginning tell you if I am asked as an experimentalist, should I jump into a new field of working with graphene? And then I respond with a question back. I'm saying, maybe not a question to the person who asked me in the first place, but a question to myself. Is it worthwhile doing so? Is there something unique and different that I can expect in principle? Um, are there opportunities that I don't have with another type of materials? Because I'm not a materials person per se, I'm a device person. I'm interested in the type of device application. And so naturally the kind of question I'm asking will be related to can I make a device, can I fabricate, characterize a device that will be different and hopefully not only different but also better in one or the other aspect than what I could be doing with a different type of material. And so this is the kind of mindset I want you to be in. Okay, And I'm trying to sell you a couple of arguments why indeed graphene might offer this type of unique opportunities for certain types of application. The applications that I want to discuss with you are all falling into this category of graphene field effect transistor device. So the simple structure you should have in mind from the very beginning is a source contact, a drain contact, both metal, attached to my graphene structure of whatever shape, and there is a gate, it could be a gate from the bottom, that would be the substrate itself, separated from the graphene structure by an insulator, or it could also be a gate from the top, and we will look at those as well, again separated from the graphene structure by an insulator that is deposited on top of the graphene. Okay, these will be the types of structures that we're considering, and I want to point out that indeed, in my mind, graphene has to offer things that are different and unique and promising. So let's get started. The first interesting news, I believe, for a lot of you uh, being students is that there has been a change in the mindset of the industry. I have worked for IBM for more than seven years, so I know a little bit what I'm talking about, that in the past, um, the industry, semiconductor industry that is, has focused a lot on silicon and uh, everything had to be CMOS compatible in a very narrow window. This idea has changed. Nowadays, um, the industry is much more open-minded. Well, some pessimists say, yeah, that's obvious because they are challenging so big problems, right, that they have to be more open-minded. I think it's a great opportunity for a lot of us working in the nanoelectronic fields and, and, and exploring new types of research devices and materials in the context of maybe post-CMOS applications. Okay. In 2004, maybe 2003, this mindset has changed and it gives us the opportunity to look into materials that have would have been discarded um, years ago. Um, among them, certainly graphene, one of those very, very interesting ones. So what is the interesting thing about graphene? We heard that graphene has a different type of band structure. So if we look into the materials properties and ask what do we have intrinsically to be expected from graphene, then looking at the uh, energy dispersion is certainly a good idea. And we have seen that now often, again and again, something seemed to be special about this band structure, this cone type structure. The question is, what is unique? And uh, my colleagues have pointed out a lot of fundamental differences between uh, this material when it comes to transport and uh, let's say a two-dimensional electron gas system uh, like you can find it in the version layer of silicon or also 3-5 materials, again related to this type of band structure. And one of the most important points, I believe, related to the energy dispersion was the density of state. So let's focus on this density of state aspect. How would the density of state normally look like for a two-dimensional system 
that is associated with a parabolic type of band structure? Well, I hope we all know that it's going to be just showing a constant density of state as a function of energy until the point where we hit the next subband. So one of those things that is clearly different here for graphene is that the density of state can be very, very small around the Dirac point. And that's certainly not the point that carries most of the current and maybe also not the most obvious point to focus on, but I want to draw your attention to this point and ask what can we do with this type of material different when it comes to device application? So this is the first thing I want you to keep in mind. Now I diverge for a second and I'm saying, okay, what on the other hand side is that most scientists sell this material for mobility? And we have heard presentations that clearly stated, well, let's be careful when it comes to mobility. And I think people are getting a little bit more careful um, evaluating mobilities, but still, um, a lot of motivation comes from high mobility arguments. It is, to a large extent, the reason that people are looking into 3,5 materials, let's say like indium asinite, indium gallium asinite, because those materials have proven to have extremely high bulk mobilities. And you can fight with me about these numbers. It's just going to give you a rough idea, ballpark numbers. What I'm trying to do here is saying, well, first of all, yes, indeed, different materials have very different mobilities. If you look at the trend of mobility, you find something that hopefully doesn't surprise you too much, namely that there is a price to pay for high mobility. The price to pay is going from large band gap materials to small band gap materials normally gives you the high mobility. And us being in, and that also goes along with a decrease in the effective mass. And us as people being interested in devices application, we immediately say, ha ha, I can see high mobilities being good for the on state of my transistor, but if I'm giving up on my band gap, right, that's going to ultimately harm the off state of my transistor. Because the off state of my transistor has something to do with making use of this band gap in order to turn the current really off quite a bit. What is graphene? Graphene in some sense is just an extension of this table. It just gives you an even higher mobility, yet we immediately see we have no band gap at all. And so it's a very extreme case to consider in this context, and I do believe that most of you, not knowing about graphene being interesting material, uh, would have said, well, without a band gap, I should really not touch this material for devices application. Yet, we are discussing field effect transistors based on graphene, and the question is why is that the case? And again, the mobility itself cannot be the reason. So I want to propose that we kind of combine these two pieces of information, the on state, that would be the mobility, and the off state, the gap, in some meaningful sense to get an idea of what material choice should we make if we are interested in high performance transistor devices in general. Well, a way uh, to do that, that may be useful, is to say the on current has something to do with my mobility, not surprisingly, it has also some length dependence and there's a capacitance associated with that. And if I'm expressing my um, mobility as e tau over m, and tau being the scattering time tau, then I can, oops, this is not working well, uh, the scattering time tau scattering over there, then I can try to capture what's going on in the on state by asking how fast can I switch my transistor device on and off? And I can ask the question, how good can I be in terms of my tau delay, my gate delay, how fast can I make my gate, my, my transistor structure? And since, a tau delay is also proportional to the capacitance, ultimately what turns out to be, I think capturing most of what's going on for the delay time, is that we have a proportionality to the length, the effective mass, and the scattering time. So this somehow takes care of the high mobility because the high mobility helps to make this number here small. That's good. Now let's try to include the off-state performance of our devices. Let's argue that if I'm scaling the device, making the channel length shorter and shorter and shorter, that's a good thing, right? Because if I make it shorter, I make my device faster. So if I make it shorter and shorter and shorter, ultimately the minimum current 
that I'm going to get from source to the drain will be the current that tunnels through my band gap. That's the kind of limitation. And if I'm saying, okay, this direct tunneling current, I'm capturing with a WKB approach, and I'm just claiming, I want this current to be X for every type of material that I'm picking. Whatever this number X is, doesn't matter. But I want this number to be the same. Whatever you as a circuit person tell me this is the minimum current, I will accept, but it has to be the same no matter what material I choose, then that's going to limit my capability to scale the channel length of my device. Namely in the sense that a small band gap material cannot be made as short in terms of gate lengths if I want to have the same off current. And so we can capture this by saying in WKB approximation, this expression L times square root of M times square root of energy gap that takes care of the energy gap in the offset has to be constant. That would give me the same off current. And now I can replace the L in my on state here, in my tau delay, with this constant divided by this expression. And what we end up is a very simple way of capturing, to some extent, uh, what's going on in the on state and the off state of my transistor structure. And what it tells you is, I can make my device very fast, I can make tau delay very small, if I'm making my band gap very large, or I'm making uh, the scattering rate very small. So I want very little scattering, but I want a large band gap, not surprisingly. But this is actually an analytical form that we can plot. We can look at different materials now and compare how they look like. So let's do that. Well, I think it's rather interesting that you find after cleaning out from the mobility being a factor of 35 or even more different between different semiconductor materials, in terms of scattering times, different materials don't differ that much. And again, you have to forgive me. There are a lot of details that are kind of washing over, right? I'm not telling you what carrier concentration I'm dealing with, what high or small biases I'm, I'm dealing with, I'm taking bulk mobilities, etc., etc., etc. All I'm trying to give you is a trend, and we can certainly debate about every number being slightly different from what you see here. But I think the trend holds true, namely that the band gap dependence always wins in all these instances. So this is a plot that my friends dealing with small band gap materials don't like to see because it says to some extent that dealing with these small band gaps is going to be a problem if I'm using conventional scaling schemes. I cannot make my channel lengths as small as I could with a large band gap material if I'm claiming the off current has to be the same. Now there are ways around it and there are solutions for that and this is not the end of the game, but I think it's rather interesting. Now what about graphene in this context? Well, again, not surprisingly from this simple argument here, right? It's down here, not good for anything at that stage if I want to have a good on and off state, right? But this is where people hope graphene can outperform all these other types of materials because they have seen that there is something out there that can do much better than all these materials and that is a carbon nanotube. So a carbon nanotube has the capability of offering nice large band gaps of electron volts and at the same time experimentally, these experimental data can have very, very large scattering times. So the hope now is dealing with graphene for the purpose of logic types of device application to create a band gap in graphene like we have successfully done with carbon nanotubes. In carbon nanotubes, it was the wrapping up the periodic boundary condition that gave rise to the band gap formation. For graphene, it would be potentially the patterning that creates little ribbons of graphene creating a band gap in this way through the introduction of fixed boundary condition and then hopefully ending up with something like in carbon nanotubes but with a big plus that I define where my graphene nanoribbon is going to sit. I define the size, I can ultimately even define the band gap, that's the hope. And so from a materials perspective, this is why people in my mind dealing with graphene are excited about the potential materials. Let's move on and go back to the density of state argument and look at the electronic properties of graphene. And that brings me 
to the quantum capacitance argument that I think is a very important argument to make. We heard Professor Landstrom talking about for thick oxides that most of graphene transistors are made out of, 300 nanometer, 90 nanometer, it's fair to say the carrier concentration is kind of proportional to the oxide capacitance times the gate voltage minus threshold voltage. And in that way, I'm using the classical equation to determine what is my carrier concentration. Well, we know that the truth of the matter is the only reason in normal MOSFETs that we can apply this approach is that we have an infinite bassin of states available that we can fill, fill, fill. We never ask ourselves the question, is this bathtub that holds all my electrons in my MOSFET channel already full? We never ask this question, right? Why don't we ask this question? Because we are assuming we have a very, very large density of states available. So what you really do is, although you know in a normal MOSFET model that there is actually a capacitance associated with the material, with the density of state in the material, although we know this is the case, and although we know that this capacitance is in series with the oxide capacitance, we ignore that capacitance happily because we know that two capacitors in series, with one being very, very large, it takes over here in the denominator, then cancels out, actually re results in the total capacitance still just being the oxide capacitance. That's the normal case. But it's by no means the only case that we can consider. It's in reality the case for most MOSFET structures, but keep in mind the density of states for the graphene looked very different. Actually around the zero point, it allows me to create the situation where this quantum capacitance becomes extremely small, even zero. So without too much effort, I can end up with a situation that is the opposite of what I have in a normal MOSFET, namely the situation where this quantum capacitance close to the Dirac point is much smaller than the oxide capacitance. If it's much smaller, the opposite holds true, namely that the total capacitance now becomes dominated by this quantum capacitance. The oxide capacitance doesn't matter anymore. This is normally a situation that my colleagues at IBM wouldn't like a whole lot. When I talk to them about this, they immediately said, okay, this is a knockout criteria. I should stop working with this material because what it means is I cannot pump more carriers in my material by reducing the oxide thickness. Done. I don't like that. I don't want to see that happen. What I'm saying is in a material like graphene and also for one dimension conductors in general, working in the ballistic regime and then operating in what I'm calling here the quantum capacitance limit can actually be beneficial because once I'm ballistic, I will never get more current per 1D mode in one material than in the other material. Let me say that again. If I'm giving you material A and B and I'm telling you both materials have one one-dimensional mode contributing to the current, it will not matter anymore what this material is. Now, again, I'm kind of skipping an important piece of information, namely one material might be very large, the other one may be very small in order to accommodate one mode. But let's forget about this point for a moment. What I'm trying to tell you is, if I'm operating in the quantum capacitance limit and I have a ballistic device, let's look into what this device can do for us when it comes to transistor performance. And so I just pointed out to you that the total capacitance now, in one case was the oxide capacitance, in the other case is the quantum capacitance, but it also means that the way we think about the device operation is different. In a normal device, <clears throat> when you're saying my charge is controlled and it's the capacitance, oxide capacitance times gate voltage, you're assuming that the entire voltage drop in the on state of the transistor occurs across the oxide. What it really means is that you're assuming that the band movement, let's assume this is the conduction band of our MOSFET, that's the source in the drain region, that's the gated region, that this surface potential here, this band, stops moving once I'm in the on state. That's our normal MOSFET picture. And how can I see that in this little capacitor argument? This, the change of the surface potential as a, change, as a function of the change of the gate voltage goes like Cox over Cox plus Cq 
if CQ is very large, like in a normal MOSFET, this is a very small number, and that means in the on state the bands move very little. Now look at the same equation and ask yourself the question what happens in the quantum capacitance limit. In the quantum capacitance limit, CQ is extremely small compared to CX, and this expression is close to 1. So now we have a transistor that because of the density of state operates very different. It's not the charge that I'm controlling with the gate voltage, I'm controlling the band movement. Well, if that doesn't matter for the device operation, I don't know what does. So, I, I will not go in this direction, but there is some work uh, being done on tunneling devices, for example, that make use of band-to-band -band tunneling from the conduction to the valence band, and those devices can be benefiting quite a bit from the fact that I have this rigid gate control that moves by bands up and down as a function of gate voltage. And for those tunneling devices, exactly this operation in the quantum capacitance limit and the possibility to make use of the small density of states is extremely important. So I want to carry this argument further. What does it imply for the scalability of my devices? Well, if I look at um, CV over I again, I notice that since the total capacitance shows up in the current that is here in the denominator as well as up here, it cancels out I have the same L square scaling, or in other words, it doesn't matter whether I'm in the quantum capacitance limit or in the classical limit when it comes to scaling in terms of switching speed. No disadvantage, no advantage, but also no disadvantage. But if I'm moving on and look at the power delay product, CV squared, it does make a difference whether I'm having the capacitance being dominated by the oxide capacitance or the quantum capacitance, because the oxide capacitance is proportional to L over oxide thickness. Normally both of these values are scaled simultaneously. That means this value stays pretty much constant, meaning that P times tau is pretty constant, while in the case that the quantum capacitance is the dominating one, we are proportional to L, and correspondingly we can improve on the power delay product according to this argument in the quantum capacitance limit when we are reducing the channel length. This is something that we worked out here again. We are showing that the classical p times tau would give rise to a constant dependence, then a linear dependence here for smaller and smaller channel lengths. This is the kind of predicted trend. And if you're doing a more thorough calculation, there are no experiment data to the best of my knowledge yet available on this topic, then you can show that p times tau, independent of whether you have scaling, uh, uh, scattering present or not, so ballistic regime and scattering limited regime, both show indeed in this simulation on equilibrium screens function simulation, the trend that is predicted here from this hand-waving argument, and we have also verified that the scattering tau, uh, scattering time tau decreases as predicted. So the point here was that operation in the quantum capacitance limit that is enabled in materials like graphene because of the small density of state would not only change the ball game in terms of you controlling the band movement rather than the charge, but might also give you an edge when it comes to the power delay product. What else is there? Well, one thing that I could have put first because it's more simple than the argument about the quantum capacitance is that nowadays people have noticed that scaling, channel length scaling that is again, depends very much on the characteristic screening length within this material. Or in other words, normally I have to introduce a certain doping profile in my MOSFET in order to preserve long channel type of behavior. In nanostructures, this is not necessary because in addition to my capability of making this characteristic length scale lambda here small by reducing the oxide thickness, I can also make this number small by reducing the body thickness. And reducing the body thickness makes this lambda small. This lambda will be compared with the channel length, and that defines how short I can make my device. And ultimately making it short is, as we saw, the key enabler of low power consumption and fast switching. Okay? So in case of graphene, obviously we have a very thin body, just one layer of graphene that allows me to get very tight electrostatic control, big plus of this material. Same argument for nanostructures in principle, scalability. And so I hope that in general in this first part, 
what I've shown is that there are some promises from the materials and from the electronic structure that graphene holds. And that makes it interesting for me to work with graphene for field effect transistor application. Okay, second part, I want to talk about experimental findings that I thought are very curious and maybe it's useful for you to understand better why device characteristics in graphene look as they do. Interesting enough, despite the fact that there's no band gap in place, right? We know there is some gate modulation. So the first question is, why is that the case? Why do we still see, despite the absence of a band gap, that there is some current modulation? And second, why do we see device characteristics, output characteristics, that have this kind of awkward shape? Namely, output characteristics should increase in current as a function of terrain voltage and then saturate if I build a nice MOSFET type of transistor. They don't do that for graphene devices. And I want to explain in a very simple way why that is the case. And I want to give you some tools, namely simple analytical expressions that you can employ to confirm that this is the case and also maybe useful for you for other one dimension structures with arbitrary band gaps to calculate what the respective transistor characteristics would look like. So here are experimental findings that I put together for you namely that upper left corner here, experimental data of output characteristics that look very similar to what I just described. I wanted to note the current increases, levels up and then bends upward again, and then these curves cross each other. The more I tried to turn the device off, the more of this crossing I have. Graphene, these are data from Columbia, uh, Philip Kim's group. There's some leveling off here, but then see this bending up, this S-shaped curve, and then the red curve, this is very important, crosses over. So this is what we observe, and it's interesting enough, something that we observe for both carbon nanotubes as well as graphene, and I want to explain why this is the case. Yes. Is that room temperature? These are room temperature data, yes. So the way I want to explain it and the tools I want to give you is there is a, the nice thing about 1D transport, and we will combine all these 1D transport to 2D transport of graphene in, in a second, in the next stage. The nice thing about 1D transport with one mode in the ballistic limit, quantum capacitance limit, meaning one-to-one -one band control, is that I can evaluate this current through my device immediately. I can write down an analytical expression that tells me what the current through my transistor is under these three assumptions. Okay, and of course, I'm using the normal kind of expression that relates the current to the density of state and velocity and, and Fermi distribution. If you plug in for a 1D conductor the velocity and density of state, then you notice these expression in terms of energy cancel out. You're ending up in the product density of state and velocity with a constant that you can pull out of this equation, and Professor da uh, Landstrom, uh, I think, mentioned that yesterday already, that in that case, the current can be just evaluated by looking at the integral of the Fermi distribution. In order to understand current flow in this simple picture for my 1D channels, I want to break down the problem into the following parts. I want to argue if this is the source Fermi level and this is the drain Fermi level, and this is the conduction band edge, then there is a current component one that has to make it over this barrier in order to contribute to my current flow. And if I'm using this expression and do my integration right, considering that this band can be moved up and down one to one quantum capacitance limit with a gate voltage, I can immediately write down the current as a function of this gate voltage. And there are really no material specific parameters as I just promised you for 1D conductors, it has to be the case like that. The only thing that there is, is the gate voltage dependence here, VGS and VGS, and some temperature, because the Fermi distribution obviously has some temperature dependence. Okay, but that doesn't capture everything. There is also a current component back from the drain that we have to take into account. This is not a new concept, but under these assumption quantum capacitance limit, blah, 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 all my work with the non-equivalent screens function becomes very simple because I can really evaluate these 
um, equations, these this, uh, integrals, by hand immediately myself. And that's true for finite temperatures, not only for zero temperatures. So if I'm doing that, I can also calculate, now I have the Fermi distribution from the source and the drain, the current flowing from the drain backwards. And obviously, I need to have those two currents added or subtracted, depending on uh, what you're doing, in order to have the total current through my device. And what you see is now, I2 is obviously drain voltage dependent as well as gate voltage dependent, as you would expect, because the Fermi level in the drain is modified by my drain voltage. These two simple equations now allow me to already obtain regular output characteristics. This is what a ballistic transistor looks like. I can add these two components. I can see that I have a current increase here and then a leveling off. This leveling off is a result of the fact that I'm moving the Fermi distribution in the drain far, far away that there's almost no spillback. Current number two becomes very small. That's responsible for that. So I can obtain all the normal kind of device characteristics, transfer characteristics, subthreshold characteristics, subthreshold swing the way I would expect it to be. What you notice here, I1 and I2 breaking off, right? The transfer characteristic depends on I1, as you would expect for a long channel device. This is what ultimately gives me the kind of response. But as I said, for the saturation here, I need also to include my current I2. Nothing special. The reason I introduce you to that is because now I can easily add two more current components. I can say, if there is now a valence band in place, down here, then there's also a chance for a current three or four to contribute to the total current. You can see where I'm going because in particular if my band gap is very small, you can certainly not ignore these current contributions. So let's see how those two currents look like. And what a surprise for the first time, there's a material specific parameter showing up, namely the band gap, because now I'm defining relative, everything relative to the conduction band, so that introduces this EG, the band gap, Still nothing else, right? VDS, VGS, EG, nothing else. I can do the same for the fourth current component. And now I'm ready to look at nanotube devices in the first place with different band gaps. So let's do that. And this is what we get. Output characteristics on the right-hand side. The left one is only for comparison. You can say this is the result of a very large band gap if you want that include all the four components. The gray one is the result, looks already very S-shaped, right? It has the component constant current contribution as a function of drain voltage from I1, a very small one here from I4 because I'm considering a band gap of 0.1 here. I2 is responsible for the current saturation because I1 and I2 together would give me exactly this type of device characteristic. And what is responsible for the S-shape? Well, it is this green one here, I3. Let me remind you what I3 was. That is the current component from holes from the drain to the source. Electrons current one from the source to the drain are those that would like to give me the current saturation. Those flowing backwards, the holes flowing backwards, current three, those give rise to the increase in current. So this gives me the kind of S-shaped curve that we saw here. Okay, and now I can put these things together and can ask the question, how do things look like for different band gaps using these different currents? And you're probably not surprised to see that if I have a large band gap, I get a nice saturation. I get more S-shaped up to the point that for a metallic nanotube without a band gap, there is no such modulation left anymore. And I think it's interesting to look at this because some people say, well, why is this metallic nanotube different from graphene, right? We are talking about graphene. Keep in mind that for the metallic tube, where I have just one 1D band available, I have a constant density of state, while in graphene, as we noted before, we have this linear increase, okay? And that is really the key to distinguish, despite the fact that in the metallic case, we have no apparent band gap, we get a very different drain and gate voltage response. So here we have the trend and we can now see that for small enough band gaps, we get this S-shaped kind of curves. Here's the full set of curves for different gate voltage. Looks exactly the same way, now we understand. It's the M bipolar character that is responsible for the electron part, hole part, 
electron part, hole part, electron part, hole part, that gives rise to this behavior. And it would vanish if there is no band gap in place at all. These are the experimental results, and qualitatively they are in nice agreement. People believe this is what is really behind. This is the first publication on this topic. And for graphene, well, for graphene, despite the fact that we are not having a 1D conductor, despite the fact that we have no band gap, we see exactly the same type of behavior. And that is something that we can understand now by adding up the 1D modes that we have in place. Namely, for my graphene structure, I want to suggest that we are cutting this cone in a lot of 1D modes. And we are adding all these 1D modes up. The energy spacing may be very small, namely for a wide graphene structure. The boundary condition that I introduce may only give rise to a very small energetic spacing, but I can still kind of add these up and pretend for a moment they all contribute individually. Now, if I'm doing that, then I'm really asking the question, what happens if I have a certain gate voltage, let's take the purple case, it's deep in the on state, and I call it electron-like, so I have my gate voltage now such that I'm looking at states here. My source thermal level is here, and let's say my drain thermal level is very small. I mean, I'm talking about the small drain voltage right now, somewhere here, but a high positive gate voltage. So I have a lot of these states <laughs> contributing, right? And now if I'm moving with my drain voltage down, 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 what I'm doing is I'm adding more current because I'm increasing this VDS interval. That's why the current increases. But it levels over because the contributions, if I'm becoming larger and larger in my drain voltage, of these different modes are becoming smaller and smaller. In particular, this mode here, right, at this drain voltage, contributes very little to the extra current. And so now it is really the density of states or the summation of my 1D modes that is responsible for this bending over up to this point where I'm kind of flat, namely here, when I'm starting to see my bipolar device characteristics kicking in. So while the turning is exactly the same like in the carbon nanotubes going from the electron type character to the hole type character, the smooth S shape that in the carbon nanotube case is only a result of the band gap existence that would vanish without the band gap, here is a result of the density of states. And if you look at the transfer characteristics for the carbon nanotube case, we can see again, and I only show that for completeness here, that decreasing the band gap not only gives rise to a linear dependence IDVDS, but would also remove the gate voltage dependence entirely. Okay, so I want to summarize this part in the following way. I want to say device characteristics, IDVGS, that is, for MOSFETs show gate voltage dependence. For carbon nanotubes, show gate voltage dependence. For graphene, shows gate voltage dependence. In a second, we will see those characteristics look very similar. But the underlying physics responsible for these device characteristics are very different. Namely, while in a normal MOSFET with a band gap, it is really the modulation of the charge as a function of gate voltage that gives rise to different current. For a carbon nanotube ballistic conductor with a band gap, it is really what we just did, the Fermi distributions that matter ultimately for the device characteristics that we obtain. And in the case of graphene without a band gap, again ballistic, it is ultimately the modulation of the density of state down there on the right hand side that matters. Because the density of state product with the velocity is not constant, that is why this term here is the most critical one to consider. And I think it's just interesting to look at it this way that although all these device characteristics, IDVGS, would not reveal this from the very beginning, please be aware of that modulation as a function of gate voltage can actually come from a number of different reasons 
and it's very important for device optimization and device design to consider these aspects. Okay, the last part of my presentation, I want to go through two experimental modules, uh, things that we have done that hopefully tie together. One, uh, talking about uh, quantum capacitance again. What do we know experimentally about the quantum capacitance? Is it all just academic that we hope to operate in the quantum capacitance limit, but actually uh, there's no experimental evidence? I will show you that we do have experimental data that show uh, how the quantum capacitance looks like in graphene. And the second small module that I want to discuss um, actually deals with the um, contact resistance in graphene structures. And the comment there that I want to make and hopefully uh, experimentally substantiate is the better my channel material, the better the contacts have to be in order to exploit this channel material. If I have a very resistive channel, I can afford not having too good contacts. If I have a very conducting channel, I have to make an even bigger effort to make good contacts. I think that's a pretty straightforward statement. Now, if we believe that graphene is a very good conductor and we want to make use of that, we need to ask the question, how is it, what kind of quality of context can we form? And, and the first response always in this context is, well, there's no band gap. I don't have to deal with Schottky barriers. Should be pretty straightforward to get good ohmic context. Everybody loves to just throw ohmic context out there, right? But please, let's see what the reality is when it comes to the contact formation, because even good contacts may not be good enough for graphene transistors. So these are the two modules. Quantum capacitance is the first one I want to discuss. What kind of device structures are we exploring? Often we use, as Professor Landstrom pointed out, silicon substrates, and we deposit graphene on top. Before we can do that, we grow our deposit in oxide that has top, typically a thickness of 300 nanometer, more recently, we have also worked with 90 nanometer oxides. As has been pointed out before, this enables us ex experimentalists to see molar layers of graphene deposited on top of this oxide. This is an interference effect that we are using under the optical microscope to see these. Then we deposit by peeling off uh, with scotch tapes or other means layers of graphene. Now, let me put this in the context. Do we believe that? This is going to be a manufacturing, manufacturable approach? Certainly not. Is it a useful approach to learn something about prototype device? I, I think it is. Um, should we explore at the same time uh, what can be done in order to scale things up and maybe create a potentially grown large scale graphene structures? Oh, of course we should. And, and there is work going on in all of these fields and hopefully we can merge the insights gained on the individual transistor devices together with the improved material on a larger scale. All of this uh, is, is under investigation here at Purdue and other places as well. So in this case, we have the graphene peeled and deposited. We make metal contacts. Okay, these are the areas that I'm particularly interested in later on when it comes to the contact formation. So these are metal that we put on down. Titanium uh, is normally the contact metal. We have stacks of titanium, palladium, gold. Other groups are using chromium gold as quantum materials. There's a debate about which one is better and so on. We can, we can talk about that later if you want. We deposit another dielectric layer because, as uh, Professor Lansman pointed out correctly, a 90 nanometer oxide is far from what you want to have in order to have the tight gate control. So we would like to see a much, much thinner dielectric on top. A very con a convenient way of creating this top dielectric is by means of ARD, atomic layer deposition. Atomic layer deposition of aluminum oxide doesn't give you the type of dielectric constant uh, that you might expect. It's not 10, it's more in the range of 6, 7 maybe, maybe 8 um, epsilon uh, that is. We are depositing around 10 nanometer uh, because of the adhesion problems with graphene. I think I'm not talking about something that you are unfamiliar with. It's very, very hard because of the non-existing, non-existence of dangling bonds to deposit anything onto graphene that sticks. That includes dielectric films. And um, I believe uh, Harvard University deserves credit for having um, developed uh, an approach where 
I think you're actually breaking uh, some of the bonds, but in particular creating a dipole layer, NO2, that allows you to deposit a dielectric on top. That's why this little graph says aluminum oxide slash NO2. So it's not straightforward to just deposit aluminum oxide. And then the process is finished by putting a gate on top. Okay. So let's look at these structures. In order to verify that we are dealing only with single layers of graphene, we are uh, often using AFM, Raman, sometimes it's not uh, something that we always ex explore. Actually, in, in my group here, we have almost never explored it, but in some of our collaboration teams we do. So AFM is the, uh, uh, the preferred means to see that we have single layers of graphene. Here are a number of devices stating exactly what Professor Lundstrom pointed out. These are not perfectly shaped Horbar geometries, but frequently over the lengths that we are considering between the electrodes, they are fairly uniform in terms of width. So it's possible to do some normalization here. Let's look at the device characteristics. Um, I just briefly showed the IDVGS, so let's, let's see that we understand what's going on in these graphene devices. Why do we see this typical V-shaped curve? Well, I gave the answer before, density of states, right? It's a modulation of the density of state. The gate voltage kind of probes the density of state in my cone-like structures, which is increasing, and ultimately shows the symmetric behavior of the electron and the whole branch. The picture is that if the Fermi level, that the line up of the cone structure with the source Fermi level uh, given by the gate here in this region, negative, is in the lower part of this cone system. If I'm changing my gate voltage, I'm moving the cone structure relative to the Fermi levels of my source and drain um, downward. And if I'm going to even higher positive voltages, I'm reaching this upper cone structure. So I'm really going through the entire cone structure in this way, modulating my current. What am I plotting here, left and right? Well, we wanted to measure the capacitance of this structure. It's a small capacitance, but we said it should be measurable in principle. We wanted to do that as a function of gate voltage. And we wanted to have a reference also uh, in how far does a single layer of graphene behave different from multi-layer of graphene when it comes to this capacitance measurement. So the purpose of this curve is actually to tell you that multi-layer graphene on the right-hand side and single-layer graphene when it comes to the IDVGS, doesn't look vastly different. Yes, there are some details. This is a more rounded curve, the on-off ratio is different, but you would agree, I believe, that this modulation here doesn't tell you immediately that you are dealing with a single layer or multiple layer of graphene. However, if you're doing the capacitance measurement, we saw a drastic difference, and that's not only true for one device. We explored a handful of those. And uh, what you see is there is again a very strong gate voltage dependence for the single layer of graphene. Now when it comes to the total capacitance that we measure, where well, the capacitance in the multi-layer structure is rather flat. We believe that has something to do with the density of state. That's what we were after, right? We wanted to explore the quantum capacitance. If the density of state shows up, then we should actually see a modulation of the total capacitance as a function of gate voltage. For the 2D case, the picture is that the density of state, at least in this gate voltage window, is fairly constant, and that's supposedly the reason why there is no modulation of the total capacitance. So let's focus on this single layer of graphene, and if we consider that in addition to the quantum capacitance that has this density of state's impact, we have an oxide capacitance and also some trap contribution that give rise to the minimum capacitance that we measured, we can actually extract the quantum capacitance, that's what we did. Uh, and presented at the IDM 2008. And the interesting thing is that the quantum capacitance numbers that we found are a factor of two smaller than what you expect. So this is still a mystery to me. I'm not sure why this is the case. We're in the right ballpark, but somehow the actual quantum capacitance numbers that we found do not add up yet. I do believe this is a nice confirmation of the quantum capacitance, the numbers, uh, the linear dependence in particular making sense. In particular, I'm going to show you now that operation in the quantum capacitance limit, that was my credo at the beginning, is possible because if we are using uh, high K dielectric as aluminum oxide to a nanometer, then indeed you can show that this oxide capacitance would be larger than the measured quantum capacitance over a large gate voltage range. Here in that case, it's actually translated 
and to an energy scale, 300 plus minus 300 million electron volts. We saw that yesterday already. This is not unusual that we can modulate that far into the conduction valence band. For you, just as a reference, for those of you that um, are familiar with MOSFET devices, what is it that I can normally do in terms of degenerate doping for silicon? Well, normally 100 milli electron volts or something like that is the ballpark number. For electrons, for holes, is 30 milli electron volts roughly. So 300 milli electron volts here is a very, very large number by any means. And uh, it is uh, in, in obviously in, to a large extent due to the fact that the density of state is so small that I can do this kind of movement that we were talking about before. And so operation in the quantum capacitance limit from these experimental data clearly possible for the device's application that I was discussing with you before. Very last part, and I think I'm going to be perfect in time with this, contacts. So in another study we said, let's look into what people like to do, mobility extraction, knowing that mobility may not be a good number for these graphene devices, and let's do that study in particular uh, looking at the length scale. Because one thing is for sure, right? Keep that in mind. We want to improve device characteristics and switching speed by length scaling, scalability, scalability, scalability. That's all that matters. And all the other things around it, dielectrics and so on, are just enablers of doing exactly that. That's ultimately what everybody cares about in the industry for speed and hopefully also for power consumption. So we did exactly do that. We looked into devices, graphene devices, with different channel lengths. And so here I'm plotting for you just to have an idea, 0.5 micrometer channel lengths, 1.3, 2.8, 4.5 micrometer. And what you're supposed to see is a certain trend. So the first thing I want you to notice is that there's a little bit of a difference here between 0.5 and 1.3 when you focus in particular on this steep slope region here. The reason we are doing that is we said um, you can make a lot of mistakes in extracting mobility, obviously, right? Um, and, and you find publication where it's very, very hard to believe that, that uh, people actually use this approach to, uh, to extract mobilities. Um, so what, what I want you to notice is if you have an ID VGS characteristics and you use your classical equation and say, oh, my ID is proportional to my mobility and then also to my capacitance, let's say oxide capacitance, and there is a VGS minus VT here, I can get an idea of what is going on, let's say in my ID VGS, if it looks like this. If I know my threshold voltage, it just happens to be here around zero, it doesn't matter, then I can use this current level here, and I can divide the current by this VGS minus VTH expression, and I get some mobility information. Maybe that's the way you want to do it. Now, in the case of graphene, we have a current that is non-zero, we have no band gap, so we might have a characteristic that looks like this. At the same time, it's somehow tempting to take the Dirac point as a threshold voltage and then use this equation again and say, oh, oh, my voltage range, and I'm now evaluating the current here that I'm looking at, is from here to here. Right? Not noticing the fact that obviously at that point the current is non-zero, although maybe because of the density of state argument you expect that to be the case, but it's not. So the mistake you would be making here is the threshold voltage, picking this as a pretend threshold voltage, makes this voltage difference much smaller than it really is, giving rise to a much higher mobility number than is fair by any means. Okay, so in order to avoid things like that and, and other possible mistakes, we decided let's just look at the GM region and let's pretend for a moment that we can do the analysis entirely based on the diffusive regime. Okay, what you're supposed to notice also is that if I'm going to larger channel lengths, yes, the current per width becomes smaller, but in particular this curve becomes wider, it opens up more. So the GM is decreasing. So this is to be expected because we want to get some information about the mobility, so really this is what you would like to see. So let's look at those mobility data then as a function of channel lengths. The red data points 
is what we obtained. Let's ignore the black one for a moment. This is what you would expect, something like constant mobility here as a function of channel lengths. Then you could maybe rightfully argue that we have um, a real mobility extracted in this case. Keep in mind, this is on a substrate. This is um, with an oxide underneath. So there are a lot of, of, of reasons to uh, um, expect the mobility not being as large um, as you can have it when you have a freestanding system. I should also point out that this mobility extraction doesn't make sense for the full range of carrier concentration. We picked this GM region, and in this GM region we have a carrier concentration in the high 10 to the 12 range. So all these mobilities are extracted in this region that, uh, according to the discussion we heard yesterday, would fall into this impurity region if we believe in two impurity scattering being responsible for mobility being limited. But what I want you to note is there's a very clear roll off of the mobility if I'm going to smaller and smaller channel lengths. And that is a result of the fact that indeed in our extraction that uses diffusive, uh, diffusive model, the transconducting GM pretty much remains constant once we create channel lengths that are smaller than 1.5 micrometers or so. So what does it mean? Does it mean that the mobility degrades in case of graphene, if I'm making my channel too short. And indeed, you will find that people like to publish data on very long channels exactly, supposedly, for this reason. So we believe instead it is an indication of transitioning over into the ballistic transport regime. That's at least what I thought in the very beginning when I saw these data. So we said, well, let's go backwards and let's associate this diffus diffusive uh, um, a calculation or extraction of mobility with what we would really do if we uh, uh, assume ballistic transport. And we know, we learned it yesterday, that this transmission function here that uh, has a contribution from the scattering uh, length lambda and the geometry, the separation between the source and the drain, actually captures what's going on. Professor Lanson pointed that out in both the ballistic regime and also the classical regime. So let's use that in order to get some idea of what the scattering length is. If you say these two expressions, the diffusive one that we use to extract the mobility, the wrong one if you want, with the one that captures both regimes, the ballistic one and the diffusive one, I can extract lambda, namely by saying I'm defining this effective mobility that has my mean naught, that would be the constant mobility here up for very long channel lengths, times L divided by lambda plus L, this expression here becomes relevant in particular when I'm going to smaller and smaller length scales, when L becomes comparable to lambda. If I'm using this approach, I can get a reasonable fit of my data here for a lambda value of around 600 nanometers. Now, when I saw this, I said, well, Either our material is a little bit better for whatever reason than what others have published or something else is going on. Let's be careful. Let's not jump to some conclusion. Let's look instead into the current. Let's not do this analysis about the mobility. Let's ask the question like Professor Lanson pointed out yesterday, current as a function of gate voltage. We know what we should be getting in the ballistic regime, right? We can plug in this lambda number, number that we just got and see whether the current makes sense. Not even trying to do this. Uh, mobility extraction. These are the experimental data. So this is one branch of my V-shaped IDDGS, right? Just the one branch, the electron branch. And for the same lambda, the blue one would be the calculation. So while it looks okay to use a 600 nanometer lambda value for the mobility extraction, it clearly doesn't fit very well when it comes to the actual current numbers. Okay, then Let's do it the other way around. Let's extract the current, let's extract the lambda value, the scattering mean free path, from the current. This is what we heard yesterday. I get a current, and that defines my lambda, and I end up with a lambda value of around 150 nanometers. Okay, so how does that 150 nanometer look like now in my mobility extraction? Well, I would say it's not a very good fit. In particular, here for these data, all of them are well below the green curve. So I can either get this one right or this one right, depending on what lambda I pick, but not both of them. And so that makes us believe that a possible explanation for this dependence, and keep in mind that 
It's a, only a length dependence. We are not switching temperatures. We're not changing carrier concentration, blah, blah, blah. We are sticking with the same conditions, right? Just changing the channel lengths. We believe the explanation may be contact resistance. Because now if I introduce a contact resistance as well as a medium, not 150, not 600 nanometer, mean free path, I'm able to capture both the current and the mobility in this expression. And I have heard recently that some of my colleagues doing completely different experiments feel very comfortable with this resistant number. And I think it is extremely important for us to focus on this contact resistance effect because you see already now without really optimizing, without really going to 20, 30, 40 nanometer channel lengths, it plays an important role. This is a substantial number. We need to focus on this aspect in order to make best use of our graphene structures. And so with this, I want to summarize. I hope I gave you some insights into intrinsic opportunities, materials device-wise for graphene structures. I've discussed two experiments, one on the quantum capacitance regime and the other one on the contact resistance. Thank you very much for your attention. Of course. So here you have plotted I by W, but uh, the width that you actually see uh, by microscope may not be the actual contact width, right? Because uh, the contact between the graphene and the uh, metal may not be perfect. So is it reasonable to uh, uh, make this I by W, or does it, uh, or does the imperfect contact somewhat come into the, the contact resistance that you mentioned? So even though our graphene structure maybe somewhere oddly shaped, the context that we create, right, always overlap the entire graphene structure. And the difference between those two, W1 and W2, I think is the only variation that I could take into account and that doesn't help me to explain what I'm observing here because that variation is small compared to the humongous current deference or whatever I have to explain here in my data. So I don't think that that helps me. Mark. So I'm wondering, the, the silicon people use these two different techniques to measure mobility, one directly from the current where you have to know the threshold voltage and the other from the transconducting, and they get different numbers. It's because when the gate voltage, when the mobility is gate voltage dependent, the thing you extract from transconducting so I think that's a very valid point because as I said this here is at a fixed gate voltage and you could rightfully so argue well this is going to look different for different gate voltage however here what I'm trying to do is choose just one lambda value to get things right so I think I think you have a valid point however what bothered me in particular is when I look at this upper right one there, right, and I would just put myself at a fixed gate voltage, namely the gate voltage that gave rise to these GM values, I would at least expect that I get some agreement there in terms of the expected current, and I don't. So just for this, let's forget about the VGS dependence for a moment. I was, I was assuming that I should at least for this GM value, for this gate voltage value, I should get something that is similar, but I don't. Is that consistent? As you saw from the experimental data, there is a dependence here. Certain shift, if I'm going to very sh long channel lengths, we saw sometimes things shifting around. Uh, since we don't take this point as a point of reference, but rather look into the steep slope, the steepest slope region, uh, we hopefully have not to deal with this kind of shifting. I think if you, just, if you differentiate that drain current thing and you allow the mobility to be gate voltage dependent, you pick up another term that's proportional to BG minus VT. Yeah. If they're different in the long channel and the short channel, you'll give a different answer just because of that. Okay, I, I think I would very much like to, uh, to, to have some discussion with you about this part. 
Because the, the question really here for me is not uh, to say, okay, it has to be a constant lambda or whatever, but by no means I could get, I was unable to get my um, mobility extraction and the current that I would expect for a given lambda in agreement. And if you're saying that doesn't have to be the case, then I need to understand why, why it doesn't have to. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to ask a general question since you brought this up at the beginning of the talk. Uh, of all the advantages, almost all the advantages you cited for the um, quantum capacitance limit or um, one mode of transport that you basically low scattering and what else? Um, small T body. These are all true for all other low dimensional nanostructures, right? People have been talking about the same things for carbon nanotubes as well, but now they are not so popular anymore. So I'd like to know why it's graphene is so much better than any other 3-5 silicon nanowire or any other possible nanostructure. Mm -hmm. So I think that's an extremely important uh, uh, question, and I, I want to address it as, as honestly uh, as possible. So carbon nanotubes, indeed, um, I could make exactly the same arguments, and I did in the past. Uh, the biggest difference that I see is what I try to point out, carbon nanotubes still uh, don't give me the chance to have them being patterned exactly the same way I want, although there's humongous, fantastic progress in, in creating arrays of tubes. It's very challenging uh, to have tubes that behave exactly the same, same diameter, same band gap, no one being metallic. All these kind of variations that I have to deal with in case of carbon nanotube make them extremely interesting for the investigation of individual devices, but very hard to picture them being integrated into a circuit. So the hope, and it's really nothing else at that stage but the hope, the hope that graphene as a 2D material gives me the chance to use all my well-developed uh, lithographical techniques, right, I think inspires people to think it could be different. Now, let me make the comparison to other materials. Silicon, ultra thin body silicon structures normally are of the order of 10 nanometer body thickness. And you can argue they are 8 nanometer or something like that uh, for extremely scaled devices. 8 nanometer and 0.5 nanometer in terms of body thickness still is a difference. So there I would certainly prefer to have a material with a smaller body thickness. Then density of state. Um, as long as I'm talking about a planar 2D system, my density of state arguments holds. So you will find yourself in the situation, in particular for silicon and other materials with a higher density of state, that you will not reach the quantum capacitance limit. Then you said, what about wires? What about other types of wires? We are looking into wires exactly for that reason too, but you have to make sure that your wires are small enough to enable 1D transport. Because as I said before, if you're in a 2D transport regime, except for graphene, you will have a density of state that is too high, right? 2D graphene versus 2D otherwise. 2D graphene, nice, I can go to very small density of state and quantum capacitance limit. 1D versus graphene, yeah, in principle, I can be in a very low density of state limit. But in order to be 1D for a wire, I have to make the wire very small for a lot of materials. In a lot of instances, let's say for silicon, you would have to be maybe two nanometers or something like that, before you see this density of state argument kicking in. And is that not something we should explore? I think we should explore it. Uh, so for me, this is then on the same level, while for the graphene, I can already show that my quantum capacitance is small enough. I think that's, that's the fair assessment at this point. Are there any negative, negative points about graphene compared to silicon, other than that you can so well study? Yeah, of course, uh, there are tons of negative points. So the first negative point is, as with all these materials that are nanometers, what do they have? They mainly consist of surface versus bulk. That's why optimistic people are talking about sensors, right? They are extremely sensitive, I could also say. Being sensitive is not a good thing for electronics applications, because sensitive means I'm going to have a lot of problems with reliability, with reproducibility, et cetera, et cetera. Why do we see different characteristics every time we make a dev device that supposedly is designed the same way? For that reason, it's extremely sensitive to all effects. So the demands on the control 
of fabricating these devices, I would say, are even larger than for bulk devices because there is no bulk. Everything is surface. It's very, very hard to control surfaces and interfaces. It's what we have to do in the nano business, dealing with surfaces and interfaces. But at the same time, extremely, extremely hard. And the question is, is it possible for us to do something about it or not? So that's, that's clearly a minus, right? Because it challenges us a whole lot. Um, the other thing, and that is something you should not underestimate at all, silicon is around for a long time. And, and processes have been developed in the industry for all the little things going on, contact formation, gate stacks, dielectrics, right? And, and it took years and years to develop all these little things. So for us, and I include myself, to catch up with these types of activities, to make nanomaterials a viable choice for the future, we have to be very fast. We have to be fast and, 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 and over coming all these obstacles and coming up with processes and so on and so on in order to, uh, to compete. So that's, that's, if you want a big mind, it's a big challenge, right? Nobody knows are we fast enough. Because at the same time, now we are talking about what generation of MOSFETs? 60 nanometers? Uh, 32, yeah. And, and, I mean, these are small channels, right? This is clearly nanometer size. So, if you want to have graphene kicking in, or nanotubes, or nanowires, anything, right? We need to be better than that. That's a big, big challenge. It's an opportunity, but without any doubt, I mean, anybody who plays that down, right, would certainly not tell the truth. What's the most optimistic channel then that you can have? Theoretically, let's say everything goes right. So I know that when, when I was at IBM, we were trying to argue about the carbon nanotubes, and I think for CMOS, if you want to have any chance with graphene, you have to create a band gap, there's no doubt. Um, then we were talking about three to five nanometer channel lengths. So with the body thickness and a, a couple of nanometer high K dielectric, that, that would be the optimistic, very <laughs> optimistic view, I believe. Yes? So, so not, not wanting to develop to dwell on the challenges, because there are a lot of them. But I do want to ask you one more question because it's something that worries me and I'm going to get your thinking about it. So this quantum capacitance limit is very nice because the, the gate work is pretty low. And I can think of two ways that you can get it. You can have an infinite insulated capacitance and a large density of states, and that's very nice because then you have a lot of conducting channels. The other way that you can get it, which would be easier to realize, is you can have a small density of states and a reasonable insulated capacitance. And then the worry is you have a small number of conducting channels. So you get this wonderful control, but you have a very small current. So in the end, aren't you going to be faced with putting a lot of these in parallel? Yeah. So, so, so I, I want to repeat this question, and, and you can say whether I repeated it right, to just make sure that we are all on the same page. So the question is, oh, wonderful. I take this huge object, which happens to have just one one-dimensional mode, and I can operate in the quantum capacitance limit, and all I said applies, but the footprint of this is huge, right? I, I want things to also be small. And the smaller my, my density of state, in some sense, um, in particular the smaller the effective mass, um, the larger this object can be while I'm operating in the perfect 1D regime. So for me, as somebody interested in making 1D happening and observing these effects, I certainly pick a material first that allows me to do that and then prove my point. But Professor Landstrom pointed out, well, but then you are not going to stop at that point. And I agree. I would like to make arrays. Now, if I make an array of these huge objects, right, it becomes quickly very, very huge. So what do we have to do? We have to then improve on our fabrication skills Pick a material with a high density of state, that's exactly what you said. Reduce the footprint per 1D structure, and then add those up in order to have both benefits, namely the 1D quantum capacitance limit and the array structure. So, so this is kind of the logic path to approach this problem. But the goal, I think you clearly defined it, rather have something 1D in a high density material than a low D, yes. Um, can you please go to the previous 
You have to direct me which one it is. This, um, I think I this, is for this one? Yeah. Uh -huh. so maybe I have missed. Uh, can you please explain the reason uh, behind the unbalanced current for uh, NMT? The what? The, the current unbalanced current. Yeah, not symmetry. Oh, the, the uh, asymmetry. So we are coming back now to this asymmetry thingy. So that was brought up. I, I have an entire presentation on that, but I'm going to give you the short version. <laughs> so you know, um, Professor Goldhaber Gordon, I think, deserves the credit for being the first pointing out the as uh, a possible explanation for the asymmetry related to this PN junction. You're going to cover that on Friday. So, so part of the reason is that we are saying if I'm transitioning from a cone and this cone happens to be lined up like this that I'm injecting into the top part of the cone and I'm injecting from this cone structure into a cone structure that I somehow, let's say by means of the gate, have a line such that I'm going into the lower part of the cone, and maybe then back into the upper part of the cone, and then to the drain, right? In such a structure, what I really then have is a transition N, P, N. And these kind of structures have been fabricated. So Professor Goldhaber Gordon, I think, has made a device structure. In the first place, there are no more publication from him, where he has a graphene channel, two contacts, and a gate that sits in the middle region, and a back gate that can control these two regions. So with this configuration of back gate and front gate, I can create this kind of structure. Okay, what does that have to do with your question? Well. I can modulate the middle gate independent of the back gate. In particular, I can create with this middle gate the situation where I have n, n, n instead of n, p, n. Now, let's assume that this p part is as p as the n part is n, meaning that the triangle there is the same. Then should we assume that we have the same current? And the answer is no. If it would be the same current, you would have a perfectly symmetric curve. I'm going to connect that with this measurement in a second. Just stay with me. If NPN actually is a slightly larger resistance, actually poses a slightly larger resistance for current flow, this current here would be somewhat smaller than this current which is the explanation that in these kind of devices, the P side would have a smaller current than the N side in your IDVGS. So this smaller current here would actually be associated with the NPN configuration, while this would be NNN. Or you can flip everything over, make P, 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 the high conductive one, and P, N, P, the low conductive one. Okay, this creates asymmetry. Now, what we noticed, and this is something that that we had published uh, in a VLSI article. I can give you the reference for, is that even if I have this gate overlapping the entire structure. Even then, I can create this NP, NP, and uh, P structure, supposedly, because underneath these contacts, I can still, through backgating, change the Fermi level lineup relative to the cone, and can still create this P, N, P, N, N, N situation, although the top gate overlaps everything. So if you buy into that argument that I can still create this, transition regions. In one case, it was the transition region between this open area and the gated region. In our devices, it would be the transition region between what happens underneath the contacts and the gated region. 
then I can always explain the asymmetry. And does the same explanation go for other one-way nanostructures like nanowire space or nanowire? No. Mm -mm. So first of all, normally nanowires do not intrinsically have a perfectly symmetric band structure. So there's no expectation from you that it should even be the same. Plus, what you always also find is that in, I know it from carbon nanotubes, I know it from, from pretty much all the nanowire work that I have done. If the material is sitting on a substrate and you're looking at the ID VGS, and you take your substrate as an experimentalist and put just a little bit of water on there, just a little bit of water. And the device characteristic should be something like that. Let's say not even perfectly symmetric because the lineup of my thermal levels is different, blah, blah, blah. So as I said, it's not even supposed to be symmetric. On top of that, I can suppress this current a lot because the interaction of the carriers in the channel material with the environment, in particular with water contaminations and with um, traps in the substrate, very, very frequently suppress electron conduction very effectively in these open channel materials. So Asymmetry is easy to explain by a lot of different reasons, harder to explain in the graphene case. That's why we use the more elaborate approach there. Uh, I have a question with regard to the one dimensional transfer. So you say uh, the, how, how did you design the uh, structure to satisfy those QCR conditions to at the, uh, how sharp is your channel? Uh, so I pointed out, yeah, very good. So I try to say that the key is the dielectric on top. The channel length is not the point, right? Because both capacitance are proportional to the length. The only thing that you can do in order to enter the quantum capacitance limit is to make your oxide capacitance very large or your oxide thickness very small or also the dielectric constant very large. So reducing the top gate dielectric thickness to 10 nanometer and going over to a high K dielectric is the key enabler to reduce the voltage and operate in the quantum capacitance limit. Not the length, the oxide thickness. So, um, it's called the nanowire. It's the same. It's the same. Mm -hmm. the, the, the doesn't matter. No, because both. CQ and Cox are proportional to L. So the length dependent doesn't help you. The length doesn't matter because both scales the same with the length. Initially, you said that carbon nanotube has its own problem for the alignment and communication between the compact to graphene, and that's why you're interested in graphene. But from what I understand from this uh, discussion is that the graphene will not be useful unless you open a band gap. And uh, to open up a band gap, you need to decrease the width of the graphene to maybe this is more than like 50 nanometer or even more. So again, then I think you will you will still face the same problem that is facing in carbon nanotubes. Is that, is that, is that right? Because of aligning it properly and making sure that it, you form that in the right place. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Again, a very, very good comment. I have two types of response to that. First is, yes, we have to go into the nanometer range, but unless we are trying to do it, we will not know what challenges and problems we will face. So that's, that's an almost trivial answer to, to your question. Um, the, other, the other response is, maybe uh, I don't want to use graphene for logic application, but for RF applications, then the things look slightly different. You know probably that there is a DAPA program even out there that's called CERA that is exactly tackling these types of issues, namely saying, okay, what if we don't have a band gap, we do have this gate modulation for free because of the density of state, can we make a useful device out of that for other than logic application? And the current um, credo is that yes, for RF applications, it might be good enough because there, the on-off ratios don't have to be three orders of magnitude or more. Um, but circuit designers seem to be okay with, uh, let's say, a little bit more than an order of magnitude, 10, 50, maybe 20. And that is something you can get out of graphene without the formation of a band gap. 
So I think it depends very much on the type of application you have in mind. How about the, for example, the for IF application uh, testing is the GM upon what sort of GA water do you expect in graphene? Is it significantly higher than uh, pig fly or other, other kind of materials? That yeah, so the, the, uh, first of all, the argument is the same as in 3.5 or nanotube business. When you just look at the intrinsic FT values, things look extremely promising. Kind of gives me a full loop, right? But what is really, why, is, why don't we still have, oh, just recently we got a terahertz transistor out of 3.5, so, right? That was the latest announcement, right? Just recently we got uh, an experimental data on a terahertz transistor on 3.5, just recently, I believe. Why did it take so long to get that, despite the very nice intrinsic properties? Because all the parasitics, in particular contact effects and so on, matter a lot. Plus, in case of 3.5, you are unable to bring the, until recently, bring the gate very close to the channel material. That's actually work from our colleague Peter Yi going on here that has succeeded in getting a surface inversion layer in 3.5 where you can now do something similar to MOSFET, you can scale the dielectric and can in this way improve on your frequency. So two things you have to put together, the parasitics and the gateability. And so for graphene, the same challenge is out there. Intrinsically, I can immediately throw at you a very nice, a nice large number. But the truth is, I need to do a very good job in getting rid of these contact effects, all the other parasitics, and at the same time has the type of gate control without sacrificing intrinsic channel performance. So these are major problems, but at the same time there is a promise for this high frequency application. What are the starting materials for getting pure graphene? So for those uh, experiments where we peel things off, we are using HOPG. This is highly oriented pyrolytic uh, graphene. And it is literally a block, a black block of graphite um, where you have supposedly a very nice alignment of the different graphene planes relative to each other. And as you know, I mean, that's what graphite is used for, among other things, for uh, being very um, nicely sliding one layer relative to the other one. You take this as a starting material and peel the graphene layers off and, and deposit them. So the starting material is HOPG graphite. Yes, from this block. Uh, so the technique that uh, Professor Lancer mentioned yesterday is really, I mean, one of those techniques is to take a scotch tape, peel it off, and in this way you remove top layer, a couple of top layers, and then by pressing it back onto the substrate, almost like stamping and peeling and doing that in a, uh, in a repeated way, you can get very, very thin layers of graphene. But that's only for the study purpose. The real approach that, well, maybe not the real, but a approach that people are looking into is, can I use a substrate like silicon carbide? And can I somehow convert this silicon carbide surface into a, a carbon surface that would be a graphene layer? Right? Can I do that? Because if I can get rid of the silicon and some approaches include sublimation of silicon, then I might be able to use a real handle wafer and by means of silicon sublimation end up with a continuous graphene film. This is what is currently explored by the materials expert, experts. Uh, based on the RF uh, transistor point, like, I mean, in your vision, which are the low hanging fruits and high hanging fruits for, in terms of technological challenges moving like the performance now is like below 50 gigahertz or something for, for all the demonstrated transistors. So like moving into 100 gigahertz and beyond the main, like, I mean, how do you think or which are the low hanging fruits and high hanging fruits for solving those problems? Or in terms of which problems can be solved? Well, the low hanging fruits are very much, much associated with your personal expertise, I would say. Um, if you are a gate dielectric expert, I would answer working on the interface between graphene and the dielectric to prevent the deterioration of the mobility that is normally observed would be one of those, maybe not low hanging fruits, but immediately relevant uh, experimental work. If you are a person that um, is very good in, in uh, 
uh, like HIL, for example. I heard the presentation at the DRC. Um, very good in making RF devices, then probably the first thing that you can easily do is do the scaling and change the channel lengths and see that you see the uh, frequency increasing with the channel lengths the way that you want. Um, and so I believe, honestly, that um, it, not only does the application matter, but, but it matters what kind of background expertise you have. For me personally, I am curious to explore new types of device application as this band-to-band -band tunneling devices structure, and I try to find ways of making use of the material in a smart device layout. And, and also what I told you about this PNP junctions here showing a very different type of behavior in graphene, right? Immediately makes me think, well, if it's different, how can I exploit that difference? Can I do something about that? So for me, maybe it's not the low-hanging fruit, but that's what sparks my interest to go in this direction of, of uh, unique capabilities. Um, that's probably not exactly the answer that you were looking for, but that's the best I can, I can do. I mean, do you see any challenges as far as ex between exfoliated and epidactyl grafting? Oh, huge. I mean, look, the, the epidactyl grown material, if you're a materials expert, okay, that brings us in the other field, then, then I, I would uh, tell you it would be a great idea if you find the right growth conditions in order to make a very uniform, large scale, perfectly uh, flat uh, graphene surface on silicon carbide or other substrates, right? So uh, that's why I'm saying it depends very, very much on your personal background and, and what you can do well in order to, to answer this question. Is your electrode uh, stack structure of the titanium and the gold layers or is a mixture of these two kinds of metals? Our stack structures are titanium, palladium, gold. Palladium in particular to make it hardy against the uh, probe tip scratching uh, down and, and damaging potentially the interface. Um, you can do something similar with chromium gold. Um, the, no, it's not an alloy. It's really layer by layer, e-beam evaporated titanium palladium gold. Titanium and palladium. And gold. Mm -hmm. gold. Mm -hmm. uh, which, has, which matter is on the Titanium. Titanium. And so why do you use this kind of structure? So I told you that one of the hardest problems with graphene is to make things adhere to the graphene. Everything that you deposit peels off. So what things adhere well in, uh, in the semiconductor field, you can find a lot of literature on various metals that stick well and others that don't. Metals that don't stick are gold itself, palladium itself. S things that stick well are titanium, aluminum, um, chromium. Um, so there is a lot to be learned from the materials side that tells you already what is a good chance that it sticks and others that don't. And so it's in the first place from an experimental standpoint the ability to create a contact rather than saying, okay, what is the best contact? Because a lot of good contact materials, hypothetical contact materials, I can't even make stick. So I can't even make those devices. Does that make sense? How about nickel? Nickel sticks well. Yeah, because yeah, nickel, nickel sticks well, and also nickel has the smallest, uh, lightest mismatch with the graphene.